Currently, he serves as a consultant to organizations which are making decisions on future direction and strategic plans. He is also the board chair of Faith Family Medical Clinic and serves on the board of Operation Andrew Group. And last, Mr. Ferris is a Lipscomb graduate, and he told me earlier he met his wife here. So, <laughs> um, just please join me in welcoming Mr. Ferris. Well, my uh, dear friend Sarah Cannon is now deceased. You might have known her as Minnie Pearl, but she would say, "I'm just proud to be here." Uh, that's one thing she used to she used to say. I appreciate the invitation. So, <clears throat> you guys are all guinea pigs, is that right? Is that what this is a guinea. There's a guinea meeting. Is that what this is? Um, I want to congratulate you for showing up. Uh, when things start out new and uh, different. Uh, I'm not sure really what this is going to mean or what is that really going to do. Uh, but I think starting out with new things, especially things that have the word trust in you them, know, are very positive uh, just things to do. Uh, my background is I couldn't hold a job. <laughs> I was supposed to be in the uh, 20 June 64 OCS class to go in the Navy to be a pilot. That's what I always thought I would do. But then I went out with this little blue-eyed blonde from West Tennessee, and it was all over. <laughs> she, uh, I tell people we've had 38 great years of marriage, 38 out of 45 years. <laughs> it's been the last 38. Um, but she gives me one-year extensions. So every August 29th we have dinner, and she says, okay, one more year. <laughs> and it makes for a great August, she says, so uh, <laughs> I work on that very hard. I over married pretty considerably. Um, when I was in college here as a fellow named Willard Collins, who was vice president of school, later became president of school. And he said, Jack, 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 you're going to love being here at Lipscomb because you make the love of your life at Lipscomb. And uh, he was right. When I met her, she was engaged to hometown sweetheart over at Vanderbilt. So we had to get that kind of put aside. <laughs> uh, but part of what I'm intrigued by is the word trust. Trust is what relationships are built on. Trust says I can believe you. Trust says we have built something together that causes me to trust you. So I want to share a little bit about the word trust. What does trust really mean to you? How do you use trust? Why have it? What causes you to lose it? Uh, what can you do to maintain it? And I'll try to do it without, after having this nice lunch, without you having to nap off on me. Okay? You're young enough that you ought to be able to do it. In fact, you've got more cookies if you need sugar. Uh, going. Why have trust? You know, I trust, uh, <clears throat> trusted our children growing up, but I didn't, I didn't trust them with the car at first, that they weren't ready for the car. Uh, I didn't trust them being alone by themselves in the swimming pool at a certain age. But sometimes putting trust into people, you can overdo trust to their detriment. Does that communicate? In the same way in a trusting relationship, you, you you start trusting a person before you really get to know them and they get to know you. You can build some expectations in that relationship that will slip and fall, and when it does, you'll feel betrayed. Trust really breaks down because you haven't been through one of two things. First way to build trust is to have misunderstandings. And the second way to lose trust that really hurts is you've never gone through failure together. Failure is the laboratory for future success. Having things not work doesn't mean you walk away from it. Having things not work says, I've had the opportunity to work with a variety of political people through the years, and most of them I've worked with, they're really successful. They lost before they won. The 
greatest example of that is Abraham Lincoln. I didn't work with Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work with him personally. Um, but he lost. He was the biggest loser. And he finally won one election. Now, I'd like you to tell me, what do you think, what percentage of the popular vote could Abraham Lincoln get to be president? What do you guess? What percentage to win? Anybody know? 53%. How about 32? Abraham Lincoln became the President of the United States by capturing 32% of the vote. And the way they did it in those days, they had to go to the House of Representatives. And through a deal that got brokered, he got to be the President of the United States. <laughs> One of the greatest presidents we've ever had, who was depressed the whole time he was President. He lost trust in generals. And he didn't take action fast enough with his generals because if he had had the southern generals war had been over in about two weeks, he placed trust wrong. The reason he was able to handle the presidency was because he'd lost all of the elections and he knew that he was selected as being the least worst of the group. Our current president ran for Congress in Illinois and lost. Our president before him ran for Congress in Texas and lost. Ronald Reagan ran, lost. I mean, I can go back through and tell you that some of the strongest leaders we've had have lost elections before they won them. Because they didn't understand. You don't understand when you win. You don't learn when you win. You only learn when you lose. Now, that's a hard one. But everybody that plays sports knows that when you have a game and you've lost the game, most important thing is to figure out what, what we do to lose a game. If we can just stop doing those things, we'll win a game. Or if we can start doing some things we didn't do, we'll, we'll win a game. So don't run away from failure, and don't be distanced by misunderstanding. Uh, communication is one of the toughest things that we all have to deal with. Uh, how many of y'all are married? Come on, fess up. We got two. Okay. We have one engaged. Engaged. Still time. <laughs> um, outside of knowing Christ, uh, marriage to my wife is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And I say that she's not here. Um, but it really is. And it's because we have built through the years failures and miscommunications enough that we've built a trusting relationship. Why? Because we found out how weak we are found out to how many times we mess up. But I think the key word here in trust is the word communication. Now, let's use this definition. A transference of an understanding. Then you've communicated. Emails. We send these emails. We do Twitter. With them. We think we really communicate. Mm. Please understand about it. 75% or more of your communication has nothing to do with the words you use. You know, like, yeah, I love you very much. <laughs> well, if you just take that out of context and say, well, he just told that woman he loved her very much. But that's not what I communicated. Therefore, the communication thing is to be really tricky. Uh, what did you say? What did you mean to say? How did that come across? Is that what you said? And, and even just speaking the English language, whether you speak the Southern version, as I do, or another version, you're going to miscommunicate. So here, here's the three things that will happen you'll have to do. One is you'll have to communicate. You can go to Peter Barstown, Kentucky, and hang out on the weekend at the monastery and you won't hear anybody say anything. But boy, do they communicate. You will communicate. Second is, if you communicate, you will miscommunicate. Guaranteed. Guarantee. Third, when you have a miscommunication, you create a misunderstanding. Those three things are going to happen. I don't care what you say or do in your life and in your relationships with people. Everything from so personal as husband, wife, to work, to fellow people, or church, or wherever, civic group, that makes a difference. Key line is going to be communication. <clears throat> now, the next three things don't have to happen. They're under your control. Communicate, miscommunicate, have misunderstanding. The next one is frustration.
because once you have a misunderstanding, unless you go back and say, misunderstanding, let's start over again. I thought you said 10 a.m. Tuesday, and now you're telling me it's 10 p.m. Wednesday. But that's not what you told me. Y'all never had that happen. <clears throat> when I dated, I had girls would say, oh, well, I thought you were coming last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of the clever ways they figured out how to escape without having to really go out. <laughs> so sometimes communication is intended to be a miscommunication. And communication, when you don't resolve it from misunderstanding, you will get frustrated. Does it, does it make you feel good to get frustrated? You know, like the, the test is tomorrow and I thought it was next week. And miscommunication creates an instant frustration. Right? <laughs> Okay, if you don't solve it in frustration, you then become angry. Anger comes out in trying to resolve things in a very tough way because when you're angry, you don't listen. When you're angry, you're speaking. And you really probably don't even want to listen. You just want to make sure they understand. I want to make sure you understand me now. If you don't get it resolved when you're angry, then you go to the last one and that's being bitter. Bitterness comes because someone in whom you had great trust undercuts that trust personally, either for you or a family member. And I can tell you, if somebody does that to a child of mine or now a grandchild of mine, it's hard not to be bitter. It's hard not to be bitter. Bitterness is like pouring acid in a bucket. The only thing that hurts is the bucket. So the question is, how are you going to control those three? Communicate, miscommunicate, misunderstanding. You don't have to get frustrated. That's up to you. Nobody can make you be frustrated. This guy named Dr. Peebles out of Birmingham, Alabama, I heard say this many moons ago. Dr. Ross Peebles says, paraphrase, the circumstances of life, people, places, things, and events do not make you what you are. They only reveal who you are. If you have anger inside of you, if I hang out with you long enough, I can get it out. I've been proving to be really good at that. <clears throat> Not on purpose. <laughs> um, but you don't have to get frustrated. You say, stop, excuse me. Because you had a miscommunication, you could go back and say, we had a misunderstanding. Okay. The point is not who miscommunicated. The point is we had a miscommunication because the, the, the understanding wasn't transferred. First of all, it may not have been a good understanding. I've had people communicate with me until they found out what they really wanted to say. And, uh, they weren't sure. But how do you know that you had a good transference of an understanding? How do you know you really had a good communication? You have a good communication because you work with each other enough that when you have miscommunications, you have figured out a lot of what caused it. <clears throat> I was uh, meeting with a client the other day, and we hired a new senior person on board, and I was meeting with a senior person in her direct reports, and we were talking about the different styles that they had of managing, how they preferred to solve problems, communicate, and make decisions, those three things. And when I brought up something different, she would this new senior person would go, and uh, I was talking about communication, and I said, for instance, you're communicating to me what? I don't know, because right now you're going, I don't know whether you got a headache, you have a gastronomical problem, I really don't know what your deal is, but you know, you're, you're doing this, mm. Well, this means I'm intently listening, that's all. Uh, my daughter helped me out with uh, her husband. He is a uh, infectious disease specialist over at Vanderbilt. He's a very wonderful, intense young man who's heavily into research, that kind of thing, which means she didn't try to marry her father. Someone like me. But anyway, uh, when I first met him, the first when we have a conversation, he would look at me like this. He'd go, <laughs> "We had him would turn and he'd go, and I thought, well, what is the problem here?" My daughter says, "I learned 
That means he is really listening closely to what you have to do. Okay. I got it. Uh, one of the biggest failures in communication and building trust, as I said earlier, is building expectations. So the first of all is have the communication on the front end in terms of relationship. Am I trustworthy? To be trustworthy, you have to trust first. Trust flows downhill first before you can expect it back. If Randy Lowry doesn't trust the people who work with him, he doesn't trust you as students, why would you trust him? And that's one of the things I'm really pleased to see at Lipscomb is this is a much more trusting environment than when I was here. I knew the trust was really deep-seated, but it was more like <clears throat> a lot more confined, controllable trust. Trust is, is when we look at trust that relates to the public, the first public that you have to trust is you know, internal to people that you're working with. You can't have trust external unless you have trust internal. Because trust says, I can believe you. Can I trust you? When good weather or bad? When things are going well or not? So the relationship of trust usually comes after you've had to forgive each other. After you've had to back off and say, didn't do that well. Communication can really mess up because you misuse the Twitter and the, and the email with emotional communication. If the communication is emotional, don't send it. Good or bad. If you need to transfer some information, that's a good way to do it. But if you're trying to get a decision made or resolve a problem or communicate something emotionally, do not use email. Some of these things you can do with the phone. You don't need to be in person. You can deal with some things over the phone. But the emotional things, you need to do face to face. Whether that face to face is through, like we used an NFID, we had uh, interconnected so we could have. We could see each other from around the country like we were in the same room. And that helped. But you still can't feel it like you can if you're in the same room with somebody. Good emotion needs to be expressed to the person. Just as important as the bad emotion. One of the things that uh, has helped me in communication, my, uh, one of the things I learned from my wife, is how to use unemotional words to cut through what could be emotion. Now I'll give you my very best example right up front. You won't get any better than this one. I was a young fellow, uh, I was vice president of the bank, I was president of the junior chamber. Uh, I had this going, that going, it was like this. And uh, I'd come home, had two children, and uh, my wife says, uh, you still have your business hat on. Why don't you just kind of calm down a little bit so the kids don't hide? It's just kind of good. Sit in the car, take 10 deep breaths. And of course, I'm defensive, so I start saying, oh, look, I'm out there working. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm explaining myself. So one Saturday morning, she said, uh, you want to be a good husband, right? Sure. You want to be a good father? Yeah, where are you going with this? Well, you do realize sometimes when you come in, still have your business hat on. We all want to go hide for a while. So well, how did I respond to that loving comment? you got to understand. She said, no, 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 we're not going to go there. I'm just telling you that you're coming across. And I'm going to tell you what your intent is. I'm telling you how you come across to us. So you need to help us with that. And, and so what I'm going to do, what if I come up with a word, and I use this word when you come in like that, and you'll know when you hear that word that you're coming across wrong, not like you intend to. So you can kind of stop and chill. And we don't tell the kids the word. Would you try that? Yeah. Okay. Well, what's the word? Zebra. It's zebra. Okay. But why zebra? She doesn't make any difference. It's just a word. It's not emotional. Zebra. So, 
and then I should have let it go. And I said, no, no, I really want to know why a zebra. She said, oh, okay. If you saw somebody in Tennessee that has never seen a zebra before, how would you describe a zebra? How would you describe it? How would you describe it? Black and white stripes. Black and white stripes, horse. horse? No. It's a jackass with a pinstripe suit on. <laughs> That's the best I've got right there. Uh, but I've learned through the years you can take unemotional words and deal with emotion. If you learn to do that, that can say, I trust you so much. I want to have a trusting relationship with you so much that we'll find out ways we can handle these delicate communication things. I'm a fixer. Home, and Anne will tell me about some problem. And I am saying, well, if it leaks, and we talked about it last week, if you call the plumber, if you got his number, I'll call him right now. She don't want me to do anything but listen. Okay? Well, I'm going to fix it. So, this is uh, what, what she came up with on this one. That is, I need about seven minutes worth of listening. Is this a good time? Okay. <laughs> it's hard to do. But... Hmm. Coming up with these things in your relationships, even now in college, whether it's a sweet mate, roommate, good friend, someone you're dating, if you have conflict, understand that's normal. If you don't ever have conflict, I want to just sleep. So what do you do with conflict? You turn it, just like in judo. Let it work on itself. What about the public and trust? What difference does that make if the public trust? Right now, the public doesn't trust very much. It comes out of Washington, D.C. Why? We've not seen any consistency. We've seen people fighting at each other. It's just a bunch of noise. And we can kind of frustrated with it all. Well, I know enough to be really dangerous about all that. But I can tell you that a lot of times it looks like a duck just going on the water smoothly and you can't see underneath all the paddling that's going on. And that's what's going on in D.C. even today as we speak. But who do you trust? Surveys have shown over and over again that the most trusted segment in our society, who do you think it would be? Would it be ministers, preachers? Would it be educators? Would it be elected officials? Small business owners. Small business owners are trusted by the American public, 72% trust level. Ministers, people of the cloth, 58% and everybody else is below 50%. Big business people are trusted by 12%. Academics are about 18 So why, why is there such a high trust feeling about small business owners? Because they think they'll do the right thing. There's just something about America that says small business owners, entrepreneurs, they're going to do. They're going to try to do the right thing. And if I had to boil all everything down to students for the public trust, I'd have to say the easiest thing is you're doing the right thing even when nobody sees you. And never hedge on doing the right thing. There are momentary decisions that come across that we go to make. But we go left or right, and we'll. It would be easier if we kind of went to the left when we know we need to go to the right. I used to watch uh, one of these programs where they have a $20 bill on the street and uh, they'll have a little something tied to a string or something. So when you go to pick it up, somebody moves it. But the one that really got me the most was to see a lady paying at a newsstand and purposely, we didn't know at the time it was purpose, purposely dropping the $20 bill with somebody standing behind them and to watch and see what they did put their foot on a $20 bill, then dropped the magazine, and when they picked up the magazine, they picked up her $20 bill. Some of the most shocked expressions I see are people working at a cash register 
You're going to tell them they gave me too much money. What? Doing the right thing based on what you know the right thing to be is. Sum up with this. Trust. Do you want to be a trusted person? I can't think of a horrible it would be to be somebody that really didn't care anybody trusted them or not. You build trust by investing yourself, by building emotional bank accounts, by struggling to gather through those things that didn't work. Communications that didn't work, activities that didn't work. You let each other down somehow, some way. You don't have to get frustrated, you don't have to get angry. You sure don't need to ever get better. I stop back and say, how can we build this trust? You have a great opportunity in your age and situation to build the trust for the long term, maybe for even our whole country. Expectations with good communication, going through struggles, coming out on the other side, determined to have a good trust in your relationship with each other. If we do that, the public will trust. Public trust is based on individual trust. Individual trusted, the public can trust. Thank you for staying away. Any questions you might have about anything? By the way, <clears throat> this is blonde, Arctic blonde. Okay, so I'm like, it's Arctic blonde. Although the lady that cuts my hair said we call it ancient blonde here, but. Uh, Questions, anybody? Why are you here? What motivates you to come here besides lunch? I've always found that behind them. I've got a question while they think on that. In all your years and experience, can you tell us of like a time where you had to make a real decision? You know, and it would have maybe been easy to have made the, maybe the easy decision wasn't the right decision. Or can you share with us some of those dilemmas? One of them is kind of a different kind of a now, I'm going to tell you what time it is, but I'm going to tell you about Switzerland first. Then we'll talk about watch baby. I'll finally get to I'll tell you what time. In 1978, a guy like, you know, Lamar Alexander was running for governor, and I ended up, under the circumstances, ended up being his finance person to raise his money. He gets elected. The next day, I leave town and go to Washington, D.C. to be the finance guy for the Republican Party and for Ronald Reagan. But you don't normally leave town when you win. That's what the other guys do. And then Ronald Reagan was elected, and when he was elected, then I left town and came back home. Check, we won. Because of a core decision that my wife and I made, based on what we felt explain this, we really felt of God convinced that we were supposed to go to D.C. for two years and come back home. Two children, we're going to experience the city, we're going to, every weekend we're going to the Smithsonian's, we're going to absorb everything we can there, but we're coming back home because God really told us this is where to put a tap room right here. Okay, Ronald Reagan gets elected. I had to be in the right place at the right time. And, every, and helped about six or seven, six really, six senators get elected with extra money I raised. Without it, they would never, they couldn't have gotten, they won like half percent. Well, my stock was so high, so Jim Baker, who was just named the chief of staff for Ronald Reagan's White House, came to me and he said, Jack, I've decided to put two jobs together the uh, business liaison job in the White House and the manager of business of the White House into one job because I think you can do those. But I want, I want to have the assistant the president, you named the assistant the president, in charge of business from the White House. That's a pretty heady thing. That is, that's Air Force One, that's cabinet, that's well, in those days, we didn't have cellular phones. We had beepers. And I knew if I had that, it's 24-7 beeper. That means if I was at the soccer game, I'd have to leave. Or I couldn't even go to the soccer game. 
or I couldn't go to the play, or I couldn't pick them up at school. But what I came back to was because of an earlier decision I'd made, I knew what the right thing was. And so we came home. But it's amazing in Washington, when, the more you say no, and I got no longer going into detail, but three other top positions in the administration. The more I said no, the more they wanted me to be there. It was really weird. But that's one of the toughest decisions to be made, but wasn't hard to make in the end run because we had already decided what the right thing was. Does that make sense? We had another case, this is on the emotional side, we had a, we had a, our first son you know, just lived three days and uh, had a highly membrane disease and uh, then my wife had Danielle, our daughter, she had two more miscarriages and uh, the doctor then, then explained to her that she wasn't physically able to have any more children. But we really felt that our our daughter needed a sibling. So it hit us. We've been working with an organization called Agape, We've been keeping unwed mothers and keeping children, and we said, adoption. We hadn't thought of it, so okay. Long story short, we ended up being chosen to be the parents for a five-year-old named Stephen. Cute little toe-headed kid. He'd uh, been, had lived in five homes in five years. And we were told that we were his forever and ever mind day. You're now going to be adopted, not in the foster home. You're going to be adopted. <clears throat> so Ann and I bought the furniture. Ann bought the clothes and the toys and had the room all fixed up. We uh, brought him from West Tennessee over to Nashville to go visit our home and go out and see different things and eat together, get to know each other. And then the day that Ann was supposed to pick him up uh, to bring him home, one of the guys uh, who was on the board of directors of the organization in custody of the child decided that, um, that we went to the wrong kind of church. I'm not going to go there, but we went to the wrong kind of church, so we couldn't have a child. Well, I've been around Agape long enough to know that if we wanted to pursue this in, in the court system, we would have been awarded the child for the child's sake. But I got this real quiet spirit that said, you prayed about it, you laid it out, you walk in. And got the same thing, so we walked in. People couldn't believe that it happened, and they couldn't believe how calm we were about it. But we got a special piece about ourselves that said, this is the right, this must be the right thing. And what was really great was 30 days from that day, my wife was pregnant. I handed out little blue New Testaments with a light blue ribbon on Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. He cries on Jesus. It was the right thing to do to be at peace about it. It was the right thing not to go to court about it. It was the right thing to let God have his way with us. And that goes back to who do you trust? Who do you trust? Uh, photographer, we got your idea, <laughs> Mr. Hot Tech. Remember, no tech, no show. <laughs> what it all comes down to, folks, these two little scriptures say it all. If you want to build trust, let him have all your worries and cares. He's always thinking about you and watching everything you're concerned. You know, just as you trust in Christ to save you, trust him too for each day's problems. Like the Bible. That's pretty simple. To the degree to which you trust, you can be trusted. Questions, comments? I'd like to know why. Why did you come? Why you? Um, I guess I'm just curious about the 
guess I would say I'm not exactly sure what I want to do when I graduate yet. And so opportunities <coughs> like this come on to hear people like you that have had more experience come and speak to us. And you know, I want to be a part of it. So. I think the greatest opportunity is when there's not a decision. Mandarin Chinese symbol for danger and opportunity is the same symbol. The same opportunity you're going to have graduating is also a danger. But how much fun would it be if there wasn't? How about you? Why do you Pretty much for the same reasons. I wanted to have a little more direction in what I wanted to do in the future. I know uh, I want to major in business and French, but I don't really know what I want to do with it. And so I thought to hear people and see, you know, what what opportunities are out there and mm. really help with our future job decisions. Very good. The flatter this world is, the more it's important that we be more linguistic. Um, I speak two languages not very well. One of them is uh, Southern English, and one of them is. Washington English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't do either one of them really justice, but we, we, Europe is highly linguistic. They, they, this is the people all learn at least three languages. And they live so close to each other, and it's so, you know, especially the French. Mm -hmm. I quit trying to do anything in French. The Italians like you to try to say something in Italian. The Spanish like it, but the French yeah. don't want you to try their language. <laughs> and if you speak English, they don't like you. Further. But they do like you. <laughs> but if you speak, if you major in business and you have another language, you, you, your value in the business community will go up. Now, you, you really want to learn learn Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> Why'd you come? Why'd you here? Um, Why'd you introduce me? You draw straws? No, I'm, all... the or, I'm sorry, I'm not the secretary. She's the secretary. I'm the <laughs> treasurer for the club. And I, me and Brooke became part of this in the summer with Lisa, and it's been a learning opportunity for all of us to try to organize this with being the first thing. We're, it's definitely a learning process, but it's been a good opportunity for us to try to see different things outside of the school setting. And it, I think this is a learning in a different way than in classes. I think that's uh, it is. It is. Just like travel. Travel is a different way to learn. You learn in travel that you don't learn any other way. You can sell confidence in travel. I'm so glad to see the school doing all these things uh, where students can go abroad and travel. And Attorney Stevens told me he just got back from Spain. I said, poor baby. Somebody had to go. Uh, but uh, that's a great opportunity. And things like this, they're again, unique, a little different. It's part of the learning curve. How about you? Um, I would say, well, I'm a junior and I'm starting to see like directions you can go in the business world and things you could want to do. and. Um, I think it's important to be able to see the attitude people take in the business world and kind of compare stories and just kind of learn the person you want to mold into. That's great. Well, I very much, uh, again, uh, appreciate you just showing up. Uh, I will say this is, uh, I had one, ex one, one of these real learning experiences that kind of come down while the heat of the debate on health care with Ms. Clinton in 93-94 when I was on I interviewed with national television three, four times a week for about 18 months. That wore me out doing the interviews. Uh, so I was asked to come speak to uh, folks over in uh, Baltimore uh, at the uh, hospital chain there. And it, they had this auditorium set to seat 1,200 people. And they highly publicized it. And uh, they even fed always knows a big draw. But uh, this is for medical school primarily, and it was on health care and what's really going on in Washington with health care. And they usually, in attendance for these kind of things, they'd have anywhere from five to seven hundred. And so I'm all geared up for five to seven hundred people. We decided to bring a videographer in and video it. Uh, we had two other people, I mean, we made, we're going to make a big deal if we get this thing. Details are important. The only thing that was missing about all this was he put the date as the next night. Instead of putting the 15th and the 16th, one person wandered in the hall. <laughs> Folks, we got boiled shrimp downstairs to feed 550 people. We got one person that comes in. 
and she's not a, even a med major. She's a PhD candidate, very interested in the subject. I said, great. So I just sat on the edge of the stage, and she and I talked about health care. Well, the videographer was there, but well, just blown away. He said, it looks like you'd be mad, upset, and stomp out his I mean, I've never seen anybody. In the band now, and blah, blah, blah. I said, Look, I agreed to come do this. I came. I'm fulfilling what I said I'd do. And I can't control the all of this stuff. So why is I going to let it ruin my day? All I know is after we have I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to pig out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. It's 1 o'clock, and uh, I'm going to keep you late.